But it is good to see each and every one of you here with us this morning. We are continuing our sermon series on how Jesus is reaching the world. Very important sermon series as our focus this year is reaching Saudi Daisy for Jesus. So let's see how he did that, right? So we're going through the Gospel of John. And today we're going to see how Jesus is reaching the world by calling disciples. That is one way Jesus reached the world. Believe it or not, we are still in John chapter 1. This first chapter is so rich with God's truth. And if you remember from last week, this is how we left off. <clears throat> it says this. The next, day, the next day, John, John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus passing by and he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. So this morning, let's see what happened with those two disciples. So if you would, let's all please stand for the reading of God's Word. Because God's Word is inerrant, God's Word is infallible, and God's Word is inspired. We're looking at John chapter 1. We're going to start off this morning, verses 38 through 42. <clears throat> when Jesus turned and noticed them following him, he asked them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, and you'll see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. He first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, We have found the Messiah which is translated the cross. And he brought Simon to Jesus. When Jesus saw him, he said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Brother Rick Osborne, if you would, would you please open us up in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to gather in your holy name. We lift our voices up unitedly, Lord. Just praising you and thanking you for your faithfulness and your endurance for each and every one of us. We just ask now, bless the pastor, for giving the words that he so desperately needs to, to open our hearts and our minds, Lord. Draw us near to you, and may we be faithful and obedient to thee. For it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 So you see here, Jesus is calling his first disciples. The first thing we see is the disciples seek Jesus. So John the Baptist said, look, there goes the Messiah we've been looking for. And two disciples follow Jesus. Jesus turns around and asks them a question. And they talk to Jesus. So this morning, we're going to look at three questions we need to ask about these disciples. Number one, who are these disciples? Some of you may know all the disciples by heart. Some of you may not even know what a disciple is. That's okay. That's why we're here this morning. But who are these men? Number one, we see Andrew. <laughs> and as soon as he's introduced, it says Simon Peter's brother. Now, how do y'all like that? One of the first disciples called to Jesus, and he's got there an asterisk for centuries, Simon Peter's brother. Some of you may be like that. Every time I go back to Trenton, Georgia, somebody sees me. Ain't you Bill's brother? <laughs> yep. That's the way it happens. <laughs> but anyway, so Andrew is Peter's brother. Although Andrew came to know Jesus first, he is seen as the lesser of the two and is always called Simon Peter's brother and never the other way around. His hometown was Bethsaida, a village on the north shore on the Sea of Galilee. So guess what? They were fishermen, right? Who is this other guy? I don't even mention his name, right? It just said these two disciples followed. This is Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. But the second one is not named. Well, I can't give you 100% proof who it is, but most scholars believe they know who this disciple is. Because all through his book, the apostle John never calls himself by his name. And if you notice, there's some detail there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Uh, in verse 39, it says it was about four in the afternoon. And to have that kind of detail means you were probably there, right? So most scholars believe that Andrew and the Apostle John, who wrote this book, was the other disciple there. Uh, again, he rarely mentions his name, especially in his own gospel. Uh, and most scholars believe the reason he did that is he didn't want to take the focus off of Jesus, right? The gospels were supposed to be about Jesus. So John didn't want to bring attention to himself. And there's my note. Verse 39 tells us it was four in the afternoon. Someone writing this would have to be an eyewitness to give that kind of detail. And again, this is widely known. Uh, that most scholars do believe this for those reasons. Okay, well, there's Andrew and there's John, and then we meet another disciple, right? Peter. Most of us know the name Peter. He's mentioned all through the scripture. Let's be honest. That's probably the reason Andrew is introduced as Simon Peter's brother, is because Peter was so prominent in the scriptures. Believe it or not, Peter has four names in the Bible. Number one, Hebrew translated to Greek, we have Simon, or sometimes called Simeon. And then we have in the Greek, his name is Cephas, or Petros in the Greek, which we translate to Peter, meaning rock. So Simon, Simeon, Cephas, and Petros, Peter. Peter was the brother of Andrew, as we've already discussed. And he was a prominent disciple seen with Jesus throughout the Gospels. We see his leadership, and he spoke during the day of Pentecost. It was under Peter's preaching that you see those thousands of people saved in one day. <laughs> we take this in a five-minute note on a Sunday morning. But church, can you realize what just happened when these three men came to the Messiah? The whole world was turned on its head. Life would never be the same. Me and you are sitting here this morning because of these three men and other men we're going to look at. Well, who are the disciples? Number two, the second question. What did they ask? Well, they said, Rabbi, meaning teacher, where are you staying? Rabbi, as many of you probably know, is a title of respect and honor. They were being uh, very honoring when they came to Jesus. We must understand that these two were not just asking Jesus where he was residing. That's not what they were asking when they said, Jesus, where are you staying at? They were wanting time alone for an extended conversation. That's what they were looking for. They said, okay, our, our teacher, John the Baptist, just said, this is the Messiah. So we want an extended conversation with this Jesus. And just that they ask this question alone signals their willingness to now become Jesus' disciples. Think about that. They were with John the Baptist for probably a pretty good while. But now they're leaving John the Baptist to become the disciples or the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, when it comes to me and you, we don't disciple people to make them our disciples, right? Our goal is to disciple people to bring them closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that exactly what Paul told the people? He's like, follow me as I follow Christ. That was Paul's ultimate goal when he discipled people. So they asked the question and Jesus said, come and see. So Jesus was open to the request. These disciples truly were seeking the Savior. Church, this morning, I think we shouldn't be here for any other reason, right? Don't be here because somebody made you come. Although, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Don't be here because it's the social thing to do. Don't be here because you're checking off a check mark box because that's just what good Christian people do. I hope each and every one of us, especially me, are here this morning expecting to see the Savior. Expecting that closeness with the Savior. Amen. So who are they? What did they ask? 
And most importantly, let's be honest, the third question, what did they do? Well, verse 41 tells us the first, th the first thing Andrew did was go find his brother and proclaim, we have found the Messiah. They've been looking for the Messiah all through the Old Testament. And now John the Baptist said, guys, look, that one going there. Look, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew went to Jesus, found the Messiah. The very first thing he did was go find his brother, Peter. Messiah is a Hebrew or Aramaic term translated into the Greek as Christ, meaning the anointed one. The term referred to the prophesied coming one or expected one. God's anointing, the deliverer and king, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Messiah they were looking for. This is the Messiah they found. So the first thing he did was go find Andrew. Verse 42 tells us, not only did he tell Peter about the Messiah, he brought Peter to Jesus. Look at that. I love it. Amen. He didn't just say, Peter, I found him. He said, Peter, come on. You've got to go see him as well. You've got to see this Jesus, this one, this Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Church, listen, it's not just good enough to go out there and hold a sign and say, look for Jesus, look for Jesus, look for Jesus. That, that does nothing. How can they come to Christ without hearing? Listen, don't just tell people about Jesus. Bring them to him. We can't do that physically. But we can do it spiritually. Sit down with people one-on-one. -on -one. Tell them about the Lord Jesus. That is what we're to be doing. I told you this before, but it brought back a, it brought back a funny memory as I was writing this sermon. In my, uh, my first degree in Southeastern, my MDiv, you had to take a bunch of generic classes. And one of them was evangelism. They want to teach pastors and missionaries evangelism. <coughs> And uh, my professor, uh, he's a funny guy, Dr. George Robinson, great man. And uh, he had to warn us in his syllabus, expectly, ex I'm sorry, I lost that word, but uh, exactly what he wanted, because we had to do 10 evangelistic encounters that semester. That sounds like a lot, and it kind of is. Especially when you've got four other classes and it's, it's a lot of work. But Dr. Robinson had to spell it out and, and he told us why he exactly had to spell it out. Because a couple of semesters before my class, he had this one young guy that was extremely shy. And his evangelistic encounter was going through drive through and getting him dinner, handing them a little pamphlet that said, Jesus loves you, and driving off as fast as he could. Now, church, we are not drive through Christians. Not everybody's going to give you 10, 15 minutes to explain everything you know about the Lord Jesus Christ. But we've got to do better than that. And this isn't in my notes, but I remember. Be careful what you ask for. Because I, I prayed, I'm like, Lord, I want these evan evan evangelistic encounters to mean something. You know? I was one of the rare few privileged enough to pastor for almost a decade before I even went to seminary. I had other degrees here from Florida before, Bible college. But I had experience. I'm like, Lord, you know, I'm not one of these 20-year-old kids. I'm 35. And uh, I'll never forget it. The kids were little, little then, probably two, three, four, five. And uh, we went downtown Raleigh after church to Carabas. Pretty good little Italian restaurant. And uh, there was this waitress. And uh, I like to do this quite often. She came up and she gave me her name. And I try to remember it. With four kids screaming, that can be hard. But, And I said, you know, when she brought our food finally, I said, uh, you know, we're Christians. We're going to pray over our food. Is there anything I can pray with you about? And you know what? 90 times, 99 times out of 100, if you say that, they're going to say, pray for my kids. Pray for the, you know, it's got to be very generic. Guys, this poor lady broke down in tears. She said she didn't have rent money the next week. And she went down a laundry list of everything wrong in her life. I wish I could say a letter to the Lord that day. 
But at least I can say, you know what? I told her about Jesus. I was there to listen. And guess what? And I, call me sexist if you will, but I believe this is true, and Gina tells me it's true. Maybe you guys ain't as bad as me, but I'm thinking you are. Most men are what we call fixers, right? She tells me all this, and I wish I was a broke seminary, and I wish I had the money to pay her rent the next week. I did, I did tip her better than usual. So maybe it was a gimmick. I hope not. But anyway, sometimes people just need an ear. I can't fix a lot of problems in this world. But as a pastor and as a Christian, guys, we need to listen. Because guess what? We don't even, as close-knit as Oak Street is, and I know how much we love each other. Guys, we don't hardly know what's going on in the pew beside us this morning. Pray for one another. Listen. <laughs> love. Okay? We have seen how the disciples seek Jesus. But now... We will see that Jesus seeks disciples. The second point this morning is that Jesus seeks disciples. Verses 43 through 51. And this is the last point. Just two points this morning. Um, it says, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He found Philip and told him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and so did the prophets, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked him. Come and see, Philip answered. <coughs> then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, Here, truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, Nathanael replied, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus responded to him, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Well, just like our first point, our second point this morning, we're going to look at three questions about these disciples. The first question, who are these disciples? Number one, we're introduced to Philip. Philip. Philip is seen quite often in the scriptures. You'll see him at the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, that's in John 6, 5 through 7. So when Jesus looked and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where will we buy the bread so that these people can eat? He asked him to test him for he himself knew what was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. Uh, and Philip, believe it or not, asked a great question at the Lord's Supper. John 14, 8 through 10. Lord, said Philip, show us the Father, and that's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been among you all this time and you do not know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who lives in me does his work. So Jesus explains to Philip there at the Last Supper, Jesus is fixing to die, right? And Philip still hasn't called on to the theology that Jesus is God. So that's Philip. Then we meet Nathaniel. Nathaniel is from Cana of Galilee. He is only mentioned in the Gospel of John. He is not mentioned in the Synoptic Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the other three. And they're called that because they're so similar. Nathaniel is only mentioned here. But in the list, in the Synoptic Gospels of the Apostles, there's a name, Bartholomew. And it comes right after Philip. And just like Nathaniel isn't mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Bartholomew is never mentioned in the Gospel of John. 
So, most scholars think that these are the same person, Nathaniel and Bartholomew. This is a theory and not biblically supported, and I want you to know that. So who are these disciples? What did they ask? <laughs> well, the first thing they asked, can anything good come from Nazareth? Now, we're from a small town as well, right? I know coming from Sand Mountain, even jokingly, people have said, can anything good come out of Sand Mountain? <laughs> They're asking this about Nazareth. Why would they ask this about Nazareth? It's not necessarily he was being mean. He was really asking a theological question. The Jewish people did not believe the Messiah would come from such an in insignificant town as Nazareth. Well, what do you mean by that, David? Why? Moses or any of the other prophets said nothing, <coughs> zero, about Nazareth. So, you think if the Old Testament's looking for the Messiah, they would at least tell you he's coming out of Nazareth, right? God chose to hide that detail. The town of Nazareth is mentioned nowhere in the entire Old Testament. The town of Nazareth was also looked down upon by Galileans. In Acts, we see Acts 2-7. They were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? John 7-52. You aren't from Galilee too, are you? They replied, Investigate, and you will see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So the first question was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Second question, how do you know me? Hmm. Now that's a good question, right? This is right after Jesus said, there's an Israelite in who there is no deceit. Jesus shared a supernatural knowledge of Nathaniel by stating that he saw him under that fig tree. Church, we know that as Christians, Jesus not only saw Nathaniel's physical location, but Jesus saw his heart, right? This morning, Jesus not only knows our physical location, each and every one of us here, Jesus knows our spiritual location location. Maybe you're here for a specific reason this morning. Maybe God has drawn you to himself this morning. How do we know that about God? Listen, the psalmist says in Psalm 139 verses 1 through 4, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. You are aware of all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. <laughs> Most of us got away with a few things when we were younger. There isn't a one of us that can get away from anything from God. He knows our hearts. Okay, so the last question. Who are they? What did they ask? What did they do? Like Andrew went and found Peter, Philip goes and finds Nathaniel. Are you starting to see a pattern in the scripture here? Amen. That in the early church, that when someone found Jesus the very first thing they went and did was told somebody else about Jesus. Now, I'm going to be as kind as I can about saying this because I'm in the same boat. Have you guys noticed that the older we get in our spiritual lives, the harder and the less we get excited about Jesus? Be honest with yourself. I remember I got saved at five years old. The very first thing I did, as soon as I got home, was go tell my lost daddy about Jesus. Church, when's the last time we've told somebody about Jesus? 
It's time that we start getting excited again and start inviting people to church and start telling people about this Jesus. I love that Brother Bill introduces songs the way he does because I don't know, but, but I can see excitement in his voice. I see Miss Karen when she gets up and, and before we even say a word, before we start the praise, you can see there's excitement coming from this stage about Jesus and how we're going to praise him this morning. Kids are back. <laughs> okay. So Andrew, Andrew went from Peter. Philip goes and finds Nathaniel. Nathaniel responded by stating, You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Nathaniel acknowledged here that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah, just like the apostles and disciples before him. Listen, church. We must, must, must tell others about Jesus. We are called to do so. This isn't if you want to. Nobody gets a pass. We're going to have to answer for this. This is why Jesus saved us. Listen, the Great Commission. It should be every one of our favorite Bible verses. Memorize it. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples. We can stop right there. That is Jesus' call to me and to you. And it's not because I'm a pastor. It's because I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. He calls me and he calls you to go out there and make disciples. That's exactly what Andrew and Philip did, is it not? Then he tells us how to do that. He says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. But it's those first words. Go therefore and make disciples. This is how God has decided to grow his church. Think about that. We want to see Oak Street grow. It's not going to happen by us showing up here Sunday morning and leaving Sunday morning and not doing nothing until we get back Sunday morning. It's not going to happen. Churches close their doors every week. You guys probably know churches in this community that close their doors. This is how God grew his early church. This is how God still commands us to grow his church. In conclusion, now I've got to be honest, I've played a little bit of a trick, but I've got to get us back on a theological good path. Although according to the passage, my points were correct. You've seen that. But I must tell you that my first point isn't exactly theologically correct because the disciples did not seek out Jesus. Why? Jesus had already sought them out. We've got to get that theologically correct. If you're sitting here this morning and you don't know Jesus and Jesus is dealing with your heart, it's not that you came here this morning to find Jesus. It's that Jesus called you here this morning to show you himself. Listen, the disciples only saw Jesus after God had already been dealing with their hearts. This is proven. Listen, John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Time and time and time after again, the scripture warns us that it's not about me. I said that Wednesday night. Come on, Wednesday nights. We're having a good study on how to study the Bible. And I told him in my first class at seminary, the president, I took his class on hermeneutics. That's just a big Greek word meaning how to study the Bible. And first day of class, he treated us like kindergartners. He's like, everybody, get your Bibles. Your seminary you expect to have a Bible. He said, everybody, stand up. Everybody, hold your Bible up and repeat after me. This is not about me. It's about God. And we had to say it like three or four times. This is not about me. It's about God. Why? Because when we pour ourselves into this, we get it all turned around. This book is not about David. This book is not about you. This book is about God and how he reveals himself to us. And I gave the example Wednesday night on David and Goliath. So many bad sermons on that simple story. 
Slay your giants in your life. You are David. You are the giant killer. Baloney. <laughs> You're the scared little Israelite in the corner that wouldn't go face the giant. That's who we are. David is the one, the representative of Christ. That's who David represented, and not me. Christ is the one that slays our giants. Christ is the one that steps forward. It's not about King David. It's not about this David. It's about Christ. Let me close on this. Like I just stated, there's no doubt in my mind God's been dealing with hearts this morning. Been dealing with mine all week as I wrote it. You guys get 40 minutes, I get 40 hours. God has called some of us here this morning for a specific reason. I don't know why. I'm just a mortal, ignorant human. But God knows why. I don't know your heart. I don't know your sin. God knows your heart. God knows your sin. This morning, number one, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, be like Peter and be like Nathaniel. It's time to go find him. He's already here waiting for you. He's already called you here this morning. You think you came here on your own accord. You did not. None of us are that smart to find Jesus. Number two, maybe you're like I was at a young age and, and you, you, you kind of got out of the Lord's will. It's been a while since you got serious about God. It's time to rededicate our lives and time to get serious about God and His work here at Oak Street Baptist Church and in Saudi Daisy, Tennessee. So maybe you need to come find Jesus. Maybe you need to come get rededicated. Maybe it's time that we start praying for other people. There's not a person in here this morning that doesn't know somebody like Peter and Nathaniel that's lost. Church, if they didn't go find them, they would have died and went to a little eternal burning hell. But notice, it took Andrew and Philip to go find him and tell him. Church, it's time we get serious. It's time not only do we pray this morning, but it's time we go find people and tell them about Jesus. How is Jesus changing the world? By continuing to make disciples. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I do love you. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for burning my heart. Lord, if there's just...